So what I uh, would like to do is share some excerpts from a book that I just sent into, uh, into production um, a, a few days ago. It's called Hungry Translations, Relearning the World Through Radical Vulnerability. And actually, a, a part of it, a part of what I'm going to talk about today just came out in the form of an article today uh, in the journal Antipode. Um, so, so I'm just going to share some excerpts. And in this, in this book, um, what, what I am doing is grappling with the meanings of movement in many forms. Um, so political movement, embodied movement, um, theatrical movement, movement of words, movement of gestures, movement of meanings, of emotions, and of course, how all of this can move um, those of us who, who actually teach in spaces that are far removed from certain other places in which we move, what, what kind of things can it mobilize in and beyond the classroom? And um, because of my interest in this notion of translations, also some of the things that were said toward the end about uh, languages and the politics of languages in the way it moves in the landscape of um, knowledge production, which is a very violent landscape uh, in many ways. How can writing be a form of agitation? So in that sense, also, I'm interested in the agitation through writing and therefore, therefore a kind of movement. So in a nutshell, um, the argument of hungry translations, the dominant landscape of knowledge and policy rests on a fundamental inequality. Bodies who are seen as hungry are assumed to be available for the interventions of experts, but those experts often obliterate the ways that the hungry actively create politics and knowledge by living a dynamic vision of what is ethical and what makes the good life. Hungry Translations approaches this entanglement of deep socio-political and epistemic injustice by calling for and by making an effort to embody a mode of unlearning and relearning that refuses the separation between critical epistemology and critical pedagogy. So through lessons learned from over 15 years of journeying together with laborers, small farmers, professionals and amateur actors, and students in diverse locations in India and the United States of America, this approach argues for just knowledges in the form of an ever-evolving search for ethical relationships which refuse oppressive binaries and, imp and imp imposed frameworks. Learning and evolving through such refusals require open and flowing translations or retellings that are embedded in solidarities situated in place, time, and struggle. These dynamic situated solidarities, furthermore, required a collectively owned and collectively honed praxis of radical vulnerability, which can allow for ever unfolding relationships across incommensurable landscapes of struggles and meanings. Only such relationships can birth hungry translations that co-agitate against universalized languages, which erase the vocabularies and visions of those who are reduced to hungry bodies. So, so everything is in the form of excerpts. So um, please ask me questions later on if, I, if the excerpts you know, leave lots of lingering questions. My first excerpt is refusals. The interventions of certified experts often obliterate the political subjectivity of all those bodies in the global south who are deemed as hungry, poor, and especially when they are also uh, seen as somehow tainted with plurality. Marked by a desire to save or rescue the hungry poor, these efforts frequently fail to acknowledge the ways in which the hungry actively create politics and knowledge by living and honing a dynamic vision of what is ethical, what makes the good life, and what brings hope. The hope of the hungry, then, is entangled with the creative praxis of refusal against imposed terms, languages, and frameworks. But I don't want to imply that refusals are dead ends. So in the book, I point to two different kinds of refusals. The first allows for a relation between self and other 
to a hunger for ongoing translations, despite the unevenness of the terrain on which such translations take place. The other form of refusal forecloses a possibility of such relationship. Both refusals in, involve dissenting subjectivity that seeks to not only break the frame, but to reweave the fabric of life and world, but while one hungers for a deeper ongoing relationship with the other, the second sees no hope for such an ongoing engagement. So I, I won't talk about the first set of refusals which seek an ongoing relationship. I'm going to talk in the next excerpt um, about the second kind of refusal that, that forecloses this kind of relationship. And then I want to make some general points about its implications for hungry translations. But before I get into the specific story of refusal, I just want to show you a three minute long video uh, of the making of the Sangatin Kisan Mazdoor Sangatan. It's an old video, but it gives you a sense of uh, the early years of the movement. The movement is now much bigger. Um, also, this is the only video. We have lots of YouTubes and small films in Hindi and Urdu and Avdi, but uh, but not, this is the only one that actually uh, talks in English, so this will just give you an overview of the movement. The writing and publication of the book Sangatin Yatra between 2002 and 2004 paved the way for what became Sangatin Kisan Mazdoor Sangatan, a movement of 5,000 peasants and laborers. <laughs> In 2007, members of Sangatin Kisan Mazdoor Sangatan decided to document the making of their movement in another Hindi book, Ape or Nimsa. Along with the writing of the book, came newspapers, pamphlets, diaries, and more recently, songs and plays that built connections and analyses across struggles. The journey has also sought to destabilize dominant notions associated with fieldwork by making academic and activist forums located in the United States of America a part of Sangatin's field sites. <laughs> Okay, so just that gives you a sense of the, some of the people and the place from which the movement emerges and where it is working. So of the myriad people whom I bring with me when I write, one is my colleague and Sangatin Ram Beti, 
The word Sangatin in Abadhi means close woman companion who sees someone through all the pains and sorrows and joys of life. Ram Beti, a Dalit farmer, is an important leader of SKMS, which now has 8,000 small farmers and landless laborers in the Sitapur district of Uttar Pradesh. The movement emerged from a critique of NGOization of grassroots politics that eight activists from Sitapur co-authored with me between 2002 and 2004, as you heard in the video. And this critique led to the making of the book Sangatin Yatra. Sangatin Yatra um, had, was subject of a controversy because some members of the NGOs attacked the book, but then the attack made the book even more, uh, it, 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 it make it, it, it do its work more. And the English version, Playing with Fire, which now has been translated in um, Indonesia, in, in Bahasa Indonesia and, uh, and, and Turkish and some other languages, Marathi as well, um, that that book was playing with fire, feminist thought and activism through seven lives in India, which uh, looks at both the controversy as well as as a translation of the Hindu book. So I share with you two interconnected moments of collective refusal summarized by Ram Beti after a long series of dialogues that she, Richa Singh, who's another SKMS Sati and companion, uh, Sati means companion, actually, so the word might come up again. So Richa Singh, Ram Beti, and I, uh, we participated in April 2013 in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, as part of a CGIAR workshop on climate change, innovation, and gender. And this is where this refusal happened. So on the third day of the workshop, as we proceeded for lunch after a session on mitigating carbon emissions, Ram Beti said, and I quote, they say they want to learn from us, but our conversations tell me that we can never be partners as long as they keep talking in the same sentence about my cow's carbon emissions and the carbon emissions of global corporations. We reflected on the dynamics and erasures we experienced during the day. It was hard for us to fathom how those seeking to learn from us could reduce Sati's cows, water buffaloes, and goats to a count of carbon emissions. Then Ram Beatty summarized her final assessment. She said, you can translate my words to them and theirs to me, but if they remain blind to our lives and truths, there can be no dialogue on this unjust terrain. So the CGIAR describes itself as a global research partnership for a food secure future that is dedicated to reducing poverty, enhancing food and nutritional security, and improving natural resources and ecosystem services. And it claims to help the planet's most vulnerable. Consistent with these goals, CGIAR's research program on climate change, agriculture, and food security, or CCAFS, organized a workshop on climate change, innovation, and gender. The workshop was attended by representatives of small NGOs who were working in Bangladesh, Cambodia, Nigeria, Kenya, and Honduras, and also by experts from Europe and North America who sought to encourage sustainable innovations among their partners in the Global South by helping to reduce the carbon footprint. After reading Sangatin Yatra and Playing with Fire, one of the workshop organizers had contacted me to say that they want to learn from our work. So I consulted with SKMS Sathis and Sitapur, who deemed it worthwhile for us to research the organization and to ask a number of questions from the perspective and goals of SKMS. After engaging in this preliminary research, I invited one of the organizers to come to Wintry St. Paul so that we could arrange an in-depth Skype conversation or a series of Skype conversations across thousands of miles with several representatives of SKMS. And this was the month of December, so each of those people also had to travel several hours through dense fog to get to a location from where they could Skype. The objective behind these arduously undertaken journeys was to make sure that given CGIAR's history, SKMS could trust CCAFS's desire to learn from the Satis, and if so, whether this trust was enough for SKMS to invest its energies in participating in the conference. In the communications that followed over the next four months, 
I conveyed to CCFS on behalf of SKMS that the trip had to be worthwhile for Ram Beti to leave her standing crop in the fields for four days and to suffer the pains and humiliations necessary to get a passport and visa to travel from Sitapur to Phnom Penh. The incentive CCAFS offered was a promise of 5,000 US dollars to help Dalit women undertake farming innovations on leased land. If SKMS continued its learning partnership with CCAFS, then 25 SKMS women, including Ram Beti, could use the 5,000 US dollars to grow drought resistant crops to gain more food security. Now, this was an exciting prospect for SKMS. Getting to Cambodia, as we knew, it would be, it was a difficult battle for Ram Beti and Richa Singh, who joined me in Phnom Penh so that we could jointly represent SKMS in the CCAFS workshop there. Despite the organizers' well-intentioned desire to learn, however, the meeting was simply not set up for a just dialogue. There was no time or space in the workshop to contextualize or explain SKMS's work to other participants, most of whom worked in an NGO format. Nor was there much room for the translational labor that could allow SKMS participants to better understand the socio-political context and priorities that had brought the other attendees to the workshop. The workshop remained entrenched in dominant ways of communicating through PowerPoints, research reports, statistics and goals that also fit neatly under budget categories and donor recipient equations. And of course, all of this was debated and discussed in English. Huh. The actual labor of unlearning and relearning across borders with humility, care and persistence that would have actually begun to create a learning partnership between CCAFS and SKMS was missing from the agenda and the processes of the conference. After several agonized days of conversations in Cambodia, Ram Beti Richa Singh and I staged a meeting with our host. In this meeting, SKMS politely withdrew from future conversations with CCAFS because of what Ram Beti previously summed up as an unjust terrain that was blind to the truths and lives of our Sathis despite the workshop's expressed desire to build partnerships through dialogues. Mm -hmm. The inability of the experts to grasp the incommensurable world of SKMS, a world where a cow's carbon emissions are not comparable to a corporation's carbon emissions, had made it clear to Ram Beti that CCAFS's desire to support Dalit Kisan and Mazdoor women like herself was tainted by the very terms of the terrain that makes such a desire possible in the first place. She declined to engage with CCFS's offer. Her refusal in turn gave SKMS the collective courage to turn down the $5,000 that would have been critical in launching an important initiative for Dalit women in the summertime. In a context of environmental degradation and food insecurity, where most members of SKMS make less than $2 a day and get less than 100 days of work in a year, and where Ram Beti in particular had to go through much pain and sacrifice to come to Cambodia, she may have deemed it entirely ethical to take the money as a compensation for what she in particular and what we as a group representing SKMS had already contributed to CCAFS's learning process. And we could have then leave, le left open the option to refuse the partnership later on. If Ram Beatty had made such a decision, SKMS would have supported her decision despite our shared analysis of the uneven terrain on which the exchange was taking place. However, Ram Beatty embraced the difficult decision to refuse the money that was contaminated by what Joyce King calls epistemic annihilation that she as an individual and we as SKMS collective experienced during the conference. The political geographies of subaltern struggles are increasingly configured in ways that necessitate encounters with difference, inequality, and hierarchy. And these encounters involve simultaneous translations across uneven terrains. When these translations are read as inherently unjust, 
by any of the parties, there is little hope for dialogue. If following Christy Merrill, we do not reduce translation to simply a carrying across of meanings, but we think translation as a telling in turn, where the tellings must be passed along and negotiated afresh in each round, then what possibilities for justice can be created by rethinking translation as an enterprise of ethical and ever open, and ever open mediation across space, time, and struggle? Can the unevenness of the terrain be addressed in ways that allows systematically marginalized and erased local conceptions of justice to get a fairer hearing in global dialogues of the certified experts? What might it take to reimagine translation as a dynamic, multi-directional process of ethical and politically aware mediation across otherwise impermeable local diversities? A process that always hungers for new political possibilities that we may have never imagined before. What authorizes me to excavate these specific meanings of different moments of refusal from a range of possible interpretations? Far from being authorized by a research project or a commitment to a field site or to a category deemed as ethnographic subjects, the translations I offer and refuse here are enabled through long-term relationships and analyses developed with SKMS Sathis and specifically through my entanglement with the learning moments in which those of us who walk with SKMS are able to agonize together on the meanings and implications of the events and exchanges that transpire at different junctures. It is this commitment to advancing the movement by rallying, fighting, reflecting, speaking, and writing together as Sathis from unequal locations, Sathis who will also inevitably make mistakes in the process of walking together that gives me the courage to connect the two hungers, one that my sathis live in their bellies and bodies every day, and another that underscores a collective yearning for socio-political justice and epistemic justice on an unjust terrain. We learn to translate or to tell in turn through yatras that do not seek a conclusive interpretation of the moments in which we walk together, but that long to continue the relationships and movement in order to keep struggling for justice. The yatra or journey then becomes a non-stop dance between worlds and languages where it is impossible to define an origin or a destination. It is this dance that enabled me to participate in the making of January 2018 issue of Hamara Safar, the community newspaper of SKMS in Hindustani, where the entanglements of these hungers are explored. So as a way to conclude this brief excerpt, um, I'll uh, offer a translated excerpt from the newspaper. It's a long quote. So, uh, this is how it goes. Many Sathis of the Sangatan, SKMS, live and know acutely the hunger of the belly and the pangs of material deprivation. In much the same way as they know how our Sathi Kamlesh died of low hemoglobin in the bitter cold of this January. Or how Sathi such as Rekha accept as an intimate part of their bodies the unimaginable swelling of legs due to a disease such as filaria and toil year after year doing manual labor. However, when we claim that the Sangatan or the movement has become a part of our existence, then we, also, we are also saying that the relationships and journeys of this movement have planted a deep desire inside us for all kinds of rights and justice, for all sorts of knowledge, and for living our lives in our own ways. We yearn deeply for the freedom to put forth our thoughts in our own ways on every platform, for powerful ideas, slogans, songs, plays that can move hearts, for all of that which can give us the tools to live a full life with respect and dignity. 
what an amazing thing it would be if such a desire can engulf each Sathi who walks with the Sangatan in the form of an insuppressible non-stop bhook, a hunger akin to fire that burns our stomachs, a hunger that can fire us to plunge ourselves in the work of extinguishing it every day with the same desperation that we feel for satisfying the hunger of our belly, a hunger that we know comes daily and can never be obliterated. And what an amazing thing it would be if that same acute desire can feed the souls of every companion who walks with us, whether that sati is breathing in our own village or very far away from us, so that they can feel and live this continuous hunger for justice and dignity in and through their words and deeds. Only then will our chants, our arguments, our campaigns, our lives, our actions, our spoken and written words will commingle and become strong enough to help each one of us advance in our struggle for truths. In order for this hope and commitment to continuously invigorate our mode of living and our existence, we must remember to nourish our collective processes, even as we fight to address our own personal needs and the pains of our loved ones. The gulfs and poisons that are fed to us right from birth or the knots and distances between us that get transformed into unbridgeable faults due to history, geography, politics, religion, and rituals, or the desires and habits that we absorb amid the loot and corruption of our corporate world and selfish politicians. We should never shy away from honestly confronting the ways we find ourselves stuck in and defeated by these endless swamps. We should never avoid the difficult work of continuing to dissolve our egos and admit our mistakes and weaknesses before one another. It is only through these thick collective efforts and journeys that we can find the insights and the courage to fulfill the responsibility of turning our desire for justice into a hunger for justice. And that's the end of the quote from Sangatan Kisan Mazdur Sangatan. Water, mm -hmm. So uh, moving on to part two, so this is an excerpt from part two of the book and it is titled, the, the section is titled Walking Together um, and this particular section, the subsection is The Work of a Likar. We are in the last days of December 2003. This has been a particularly cold winter in Uttar Pradesh. In Richa Singh's small rented home, the one large hard bed guarded by a tiny room heater serves as, as more than just a shared sleeping area. It's also the office, the living room, the eating room, the playroom. Um, for seven of us, Richa's nine-year-old son Parth, my six-year-old daughter Medha, Richa's mother, whom we call Amma, Richa's brother Apu, our colleague Mukesh, and of course the two of us, the two Richas. With wool shawls drawn closely to our heavily clad bodies and with our legs slid under two weighty cotton razais, the whole herd of us is huddled together on a foggy winter night. On top of the razais, we have spread a newspaper on which Apu has poured a whole kilo of warm peanuts that we are cracking out of their shells and rubbing, on to rock, rubbing in rock salt before popping them into our mouths. This is a well-tested method of gaining comfort during the imprisonment these freezing winter nights impose on us. I read aloud a section I have just finished drafting of the last chapter of Sangatan's collective book in Hindi, which at that time is yet to be named. It focuses on the experiences of village-based NGO workers with the trainers who come to teach them, but who end up violating the trust of those they're trying to help. The material is serious, but the ironies presented in the story are so familiar that even Amma can't help giggling. Mukesh pats my back approvingly while also affectionately poking uh, at my academic credentials. Wah, Professor Saiva, Sundar likha hai. By now I have become used to Mukesh's relentless teasing when he shifts from Richa to Professor Sahiba to distinguish, to distinguish me from Richa Singh. 
He similarly switches to Didi when he sometimes talk to, talks to Richa Singh. Didi, literally older sister, is the reverential title by which Richa Singh is referred to by everyone in the villages where Sangatan works. An experienced activist dedicated to radical pedagogies, Mukesh has come up with great nicknames in jest. Professor Sahiba suggests that I may be a Sangatin, but I'm also a globe-trotting professor, a status and privilege that other Sangatins do not share with me. Yet his teasing never fails to convey his belief in the labor I'm contributing to the dream we are all feeling together. I'm touched by his words, but before I can thank him for his compliment, Richa Singh interjects, don't praise her like that. She's a Likhar. This is the least she can do. Likhar in Hindi means a writer who writes profusely. But there's something about the way Richa Singh uses that term to interrupt Mukesh that perplexes me. On the surface, she seems to be saying that because I can write abundantly, my labor does not merit his compliment. Is there something else that she's trying to get at? It is hard to tell whether it is the sudden slowing down of the speed with which we have been cracking the peanut shells, or if it is an expression that has just come on my face, but Richa Singh immediately senses that something has not gone right with the exchange. She wants to bring the mood of the conversation back to where it was. Don't misunderstand me, she says matter-of-factly. To you, written words come easily. Writing, to, writing is your privilege and your passion. But when we, when we are moved by your writing, it is not necessarily because you write well. It is because you can write in our language in ways that makes our story matters, uh, that makes our stories matter. If you write, uh, sorry, you can write as if we have written those stories ourselves. And that's the end of the quote from Richa Singh. Since that foggy, damp December night, more than 15 years ago, when a group of nine women had barely begun to imagine an organization that approached empowerment in a form that was liberated from NGO-dominated imagination, I have never stopped thinking about that conversation. What does it mean to be a Likhar in the context of being a Sathi of SKMS? What does it mean to write the stories of SKMS in ways that those stories can come to matter in the lives of my sathis as well as in the different locations that they and I occupy? Can I write these stories without exploiting my sathis so that my own purposes for retelling their stories do not unintentionally contradict or undermine their struggles for epistemic justice and the work they want these and other similar stories to do? What joys and burdens come with the responsibility of writing those stories as someone who has the tools and privilege to be able to write in ways that many of my sathis cannot? Like a shuttlecock in a badminton court, the stories of the struggle move between different sections of the court. I have to keep switching places to make sure that I can hit them right with my words so that stories of struggle can do their work. In this strange game, there is no singular teammate and no singular opponent. The shuttlecock, too, becomes a player whose movement depends not only on how I hit it, but also on the contours of the court where the game is unfolding. It is as easy for me to slip as it is to drop a shuttlecock. Like the endless page that is also an unbound stage, this game of hitting stories with the most apt words tenses, pauses, and silences cannot conclude, for concluding the game is the end of learning. My training as a Likhar continues. Movement, Sangathan, in togetherness with bodies, breaths, emotions, words, worlds, and traces that walk, fight, stretch, expand, deepen, and sometimes pull in different ways, hungry, journeys of loosening bodies, passions, visions, words in remaking, in concert, andolan, movement, shifts, agitation, passage, emotions of satis that trigger actions, affects, effects, Tireless dreams, screams, responsibilities for justice. 
unending lessons heeded in the song before the next utterance, halt, turn in the journey, in the sentence, movement, move heart and mind in response to another's movement, translations, forever struggle to write responsibly. And now I'm going to read an excerpt from part four of the book. And this, this uh, part four is, is a syllabus in 15 acts. So I'm going to just read some bits and pieces from the syllabus. It's kind of like a 55-page long syllabus. Uh, so prologue of the syllabus. Um, working together for a more equitable and just world often requires unlearning and relearning the stories that make global politics. This, this six-part syllabus for stories, bodies, movements, a combined graduate and undergraduate class, invites us to embrace such collective labor by grappling with the meanings of building situated solidarities through radical vulnerability as a collectively owned praxis. Taking as its inspiration the methodologies of building and sustaining long-term situated solidarities with social movements, the course uses storytelling and theater as modes of embodied unlearning and relearning. It searches for an intense intimacy with sites that are claimed by academics of the global north as sites of their research or activism, but that are often simultaneously othered in the classroom as places far removed from the researcher, teacher, and student. In so doing, the course seeks to unsettle the modes of learning that dominate many neoliberal R1 universities in the United States by exploring the impossibility of translating through the classroom, a methodology of building and sustaining deep relationships with ongoing struggles in the global south. It asks, how do we bring our stories into serious conversations with the histories and geographies we have inherited? How do we learn to see these stories as simultaneously global and intimate, as marked by both love and violence, as constituted by protagonists who are also antagonists and of victims who are also victimizers? All the course participants become co-travelers and co-authors as they grapple with these questions through reading, writing, remembering, telling, sculpting, scripting, and performing together in an unfolding journey over the semester. Part two of the syllabus, one more time. One more time, you ask me to tell you another one of those stories, piercing eyes on fire, chase the dark, turmeric saris bleed, large calloused hands pound against eardrums, umbilical cords entwine, bamboo pens stab guts, unverified ancestors, out of time, turn away words, Poison dictionaries, footnotes, glossaries, without permission, a million needles sigh. Wounds, desires, destinies received out of line, snatched blessings girls don't inherit. And you ask me one more time to tell you a story oozing secrets, sun-soaked green mangoes in Heen Kalonji, young feet salted in ocean's chest, don't return to shore, bonded server, parent, unbound. Not so that you may heave, sob, hounded, nor honor it by communing with the haunted, haunting collisions, but to frame another intervention, pronounce meanings, accentless, strip flesh, muscle, sensation, plastic petals, incapable of twisting, exploring, moving, collaborating, Lips don't come together to echo sounds, rebound, unregistered. But tongues, lips, throats, guts, stripped of sensations will beat story flat like a drenched old rag 
beaten repeatedly with a chunky stick, hand washed on stone by a body squatting, bent over it, beating, breathing, beating, surrounded by a mountain, bed sheets, bras, salwars, skirts, shirts and saris, rags, pants, petticoats, underwear and heavy blue jeans, blood stained and waiting to be washed before the trickle in the tap disappears, before the legs become overwhelmed by that full heavy feeling, making it impossible to stand on your feet after you are done washing that mountain. If my metaphors don't make sense, it's because your body does not know what I know from learning what it is like to beat clothes on stones under, under trickles of water, years, decades, generations, yet you demand another story as if my tongue was not my own hot flesh. You retell without shiver or stammer, without feeling in a piece of your bones for a second, my wounded everyday sort of joy, pain, of that overwhelming fullness, that piercing, deadening heaviness in my thighs, moving upwards and spreading into my arms, shoulders, up my neck, connects with veins of my soul. You will never realize you cannot know in your eagerness to retell another one of these stories you've gone without learning how to squat for hours, washing, breathing, beating, cloth after cloth on the stone before that trickle vanishes. One more time first flowed as I envisioned the syllabus and I share it here as a gesture of radical vulnerability. In expressing a desire for common goals in this journey, where I am asking each one of us to offer intimate pieces of ourselves, this is an initial offering. I invite you to respond to this poem in whatever ways makes the most sense to you. Explore what it might mean for you to grapple with what Edward Gleason calls the right to opacity of one's stories, movements, and locations, and to guard against an engagement with the other that slips into appropriation or into a desire to fully know or translate. Next part of the syllabus, the 15 acts. So I'm just going to share some pieces from the first act. Act one, letting go of our story. Synopsis. Understanding the goals and visions of this class, what does it mean to let go of our stories? Scene one. In my role as a facilitator of this class, I ask you to listen attentively as I share with you my vision for this course and invite you to become part of this journey. I see this course as a collective journey whose path can be outlined by me but whose meanings and outcomes cannot be predicted because by its very definition, the journey has to be co-owned by and co-evolved with all the travelers. In other words, how the vision unfolds and acquires its resonances and depths depends on how much of ourselves each of us is prepared to give and take in this journey. How much of ourselves we are prepared to risk in this journey of learning and internalizing critical lessons about this aesthetics, ethics, politics, and responsibility of telling and receiving stories. Remember, from the beginning to end, the syllabus remains a fluid text, a flowing river in which each of us brings some of the many streams and rivulets that make us. The text is meant to remain a work in progress one that would hopefully continue to find meanings in our future lives long after the end of the semester. Stories, bodies, and borders. Let us all focus on our bodies for a moment. Let us think of the body not as a container that is compartmentalized from our mind or heart, but the body as a series of flows and confluences in which the physical body that is flesh, muscles, bones, and blood, is inseparable from what we call the mind, the soul, the heart. All these parts blur, blend, and merge into and out of one another in a series of never-ending movements that is our body. Now let us think of a story from our childhoods that we are attached to. Let us try to feel what this body as an ever-flowing confluence of mind, soul, heart, and all that makes us does 
when we remember, tell, or perform, or when we see, hear, or read that story? How does an awareness of the ways in which our bodies are inserted in the telling and receiving of stories affect how we recall, narrate, and absorb stories? How do we experience our stories or memories through the language of our senses, such as smell, taste, touch, hearing, or sight? How might we connect with the stories that make each one of us by working consciously to move beyond words? How might our efforts to connect with another through hearing, seeing, or touching allow us to embrace and retell stories in hitherto unfamiliar ways while appreciating the plurality of practices through which translations or retellings happen? These questions invite us collectively to remember and deconstruct the ways in which histories of past violence, traumas, and oppressions continue to inhabit our bodies and inform our responses, our movements. This course asks us to insert the relationally defined body as a primary <coughs> site of knowledge that allows multiple streams of stories to crisscross, overlap, erupt, flow, and permeate through our consciousness and our skins and movements as they navigate the borders of not only place and time, but also of flesh, muscles, memories, and desires. To explore such learning, we will reflect on our own bodily responses to certain stories and passages while simultaneously grappling with how to share those responses with one another. This effort, at once individual and collective, will be an essential part of learning how to read and reread ethically in order to form radically collaborative practices of storytelling. Telling in turn, dancing with stories. Stories have the capacity to cross borders, but when and how do they cross borders? When do they refuse to cross borders? What are the implications of these border crossings and refusals to cross? What happens to a familiar story when we tell it to a new audience in a new setting? We often think about these questions in terms of carrying across a story, an act where the storyteller is expected to faithfully relay a story in singular form from one context to another. But what if we rethink story as an inherently plural text, where the story is not a property to be owned or exchanged, but a dynamic text that lives in and through a series of tellings in which it is passed along from one person to the next. In this sense, a storyteller becomes someone who tells in turn, and I'm using Merrill's words here, um, and in so doing becomes a small part of the ocean of the streams of story, contributing to the life of the story while also redirecting its flow. Yet another way to reimagine retellings of a story is in terms of a never-ending dance where there is no pure origin or destination of the retold story, but where the praxis of engagement and transformation places the origin and the destination in a continuous state of productive tension and overlap so that the storytelling becomes a continuous process of revision and translation. Storytelling as responsibility. What responsibilities come with being entrusted with the task of telling in turn, when our commitments between and across worlds require us to dance with stories? What is the difference between being entrusted with the responsibility to retell and move with stories on the one hand, and feeling entitled to narrate a story on the other? What kind of responsibility comes when we receive a story from the other side? What does it take to retell stories of another without making that another into an other? Can we begin to think together about what constitute the ethics and politics of storytelling based on this preliminary conversation? A set of tentative collective understandings that we can revisit and refine over the course of the semester? Storytelling as global politics. What understandings exist among members of this class about global politics? What do we think constitutes the global, and how do we understand politics? 
What happens if we regard global politics as a politics of telling and receiving stories about an other? Viewed this way, storytelling becomes a space in which the intimate and the global are continuously invoked and constituted in relation to each other in ways that the global is always present in the intimate and vice versa. I invite you to explore these questions while also adding one more requirement to this collective journey. What might it mean for you to become radically vulnerable with one another in the collective context of this class and to accept such vulnerability as the first step in building the trust that is essential in order to swim together in an ocean of ever flowing stories. In this ocean, the labor of encountering, immersing, meandering, and reflowing with and within each stream must struggle continuously with what it means to do justice to a story as its receiver and teller in any given context. If such radical vulnerability feels forced or uncomfortable in the context of this classroom, what kinds of questions must this discomfort raise about stories that researchers, educators, activists, and other experts retell about those who are absent or excluded from those spaces? What are the implications of this discussion for questions of social justice and for the ways in which knowledges are made, claimed, and consumed? Act one, scene two. Introduce yourself with a wordless gesture to the whole group. Then find a partner and share the intended meaning of your gesture with them, followed by a story that tells something about you that is often not apparent to, to most people in this university. After 10 minutes of sharing by both partners, the whole class reassembles as a large group. Each person shares what they learned about their partner. Act 1, Scene 3. Now each person finds a different partner. Each pair has approximately eight minutes in which both members share with, we, with each other a story from their childhoods that carries meaning for them. Listen attentively as each person will soon be asked to retell the story. Do not take written notes, just listen. Act one, scene four. Return to the large group and in no more than two minutes, share your partner's story as if it is your own story. This recalling and retelling in an edited form will require you to restructure the story. You cannot make eye contact or check in with your partner while you are retelling their story as your own. Every, after everyone has had a chance to retell the stories, the class collectively considers the following questions. What did it feel to own the story of your partner? What did it feel like to let go of your story? What was it like to not be able to make eye contact with your partner while telling their story and while listening to your own story being told? How did you feel another's story? Was there any pain, regret, or satisfaction derived from the process? How did you make decisions about editing the story, about what should be said and about what should remain unsaid? What happened to the story when it was carried across? What did we collectively learn about the ethical responsibility of storytelling from this exercise? And that is the end of Act 1. And I'm coming very close to the end. Uh, so this is, in the end, I just want to share some lines from the epilogue of the book that are written with, uh, ep epilogue is written with Siddharth Ayangar and Sara Musafir. These were two students who walked uh, for the whole year last year uh, during the, the, the first two semesters when this class was taught and we, we co-built plays together in, in both classes. So some lines from, from that. The journey is shared in hungry translations, travel in and across the interstitial spaces of being and becoming, of refusing and breaking, of rising and flowing from within the breaks, and of hungrily searching for relations and connections. Connections and relations that push us to participate in translations that unsettle, to embrace the refusals that remain hungry for justice, and to look for liberatory knowledges and for modes of living and dying that can never be adequately understood, accessed, or contained within the structures, genres, formats, and languages celebrated by the university and the narrow worlds it reinforces and reproduces. 
as we continue then on this never ending path of learning about all the ways in which we must unhouse ourselves and our souls, we remember too the refrain from a song composed by our classmates, Julie, Kiwi, and Laura, to tie together our play, Fra Fractured Threads. And these are the lyrics. And can we remember to do right by these stories? They weren't made for me, they were made to be free. And when we are parted, plant my body in the ground so roots of new memories can grow all around. For us, all of these are powerful invitations to keep reopening the meanings and responsibilities of hungry translations. Thank you.